What I would like to do today is I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about AI use cases. And the way I've constructed this webinar is around uh, three main topics, AI use cases in general, telecom AI use cases, and telecom impacting AI use cases. Now, please do me a favor, and if you have questions, please ask. I would like to answer questions in real time. And um, so just please jump onto the chat and um, ask questions anytime through our presentation today. Do me one favor, if you would please, at the bottom of the chat, there is a drop down menu. Please set this to where it includes um, all attendees. That way everybody can see the questions and that way it's a little bit easier to answer them. Let's get started with AI use cases in general. And I always like to start with this slide. And this is what I refer to as the AI and automation life cycle. It's the high level process of how an AI algorithm gets trained. Now, before I even go through this, let me go and let me talk about one thing first. We're gonna use the term artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is a very generic term. It comes from science fiction from the 1940s. And if you've never had the opportunity to read Isaac Asimov's science fiction from the 1940s and 1950s, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic stuff. And specifically, he had a series of books that are referred to as the robot series. And in the robot series, it's about um, a human detective and a robot who is assisting him to solve a murder. And if you've ever heard about the, the three laws of robotics or anything like that, that comes from Isaac Asimov. And in the 1940s and 50s, when Isaac Asimov thought of this you know, artificial intelligence, it really was trying to be a computer generated human mind. It, was, it had emotional, creative thought. We're not there. What we're focusing on is a form of AI that's referred to as narrow AI, which is really trying to solve a problem. There is a form of AI that is, is generalized AGI, artificial general intelligence. And there are some people who are looking at doing that. It's a fascinating study. Uh, if anybody does have questions about where to start, send me an email, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, but we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about narrow AI. Now within narrow AI, there are really two subcategories of narrow AI. One is called a rules-based narrow AI, and the other is called a machine learning. Now, rules-based is an older method. This is where you had a, a number of if-then statements trying to um, understand how to react. And if you remember back in the late 1990s, when IBM's Big Blue beat Gary Kasparov two games out of three at chess, and Gary Kasparov at that time was the best chess player in the world. He's a grandmaster of chess. That was an amazing thing because nobody believed we could actually have a computer beat a human being in a game as complicated as chess. That was a rules-based system. That was this set of if-then statements. If I move a pawn, you should move your rook. We don't do that much today. There's still some instances of rules-based, um, but not that much. What we're focused on is what's referred to as machine learning. And machine learning is really trying to learn things based off of data. And a subcomponent of machine learning is called deep learning. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because this term learning is really important. And we are trying to learn something. We're trying to, to, to learn some behavior, some prediction based off of a set of data. And so with that backdrop, this slide makes a lot more sense. So this is the AI and automation lifecycle. 
The first thing that we need is we need data, representative data of the problem that we're trying to solve. If you're trying to cure cancer, you need um, MRI pictures of people with and without cancer, or detect cancer, I should say. If you're trying to um, detect or, or have an algorithm that can tell pictures of cats versus pictures of dogs, you need to have pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. So this data is going to be something that has something we want to learn. In the telecom space, this might be network data, might be cell site data, might be customer data, might be marketing data, whatever that is. Typically, it's going to be what's referred to as labeled data. And what labeled data means is it has data and it has some label, some outcome that we want. And the easiest way of thinking of this is cats and dogs. If I have pictures of cats and they're labeled cats and pictures of dogs that are labeled dogs. So the first thing I need to do is I need to gather my data. Now this can be quite challenging. I don't want to make it seem like this is easy, but this is the first step. Second, We need to create a model. And if, you're, if you've ever heard the phrase training a data model, training an AI model, this is that training phase. This is where we're trying to take our data and we're trying to learn how to make a prediction based off of new data. I've taken 5,000 pictures of cats, 5,000 pictures of dogs. I've built an algorithm to tell the difference between cats and dogs. And now I've got a new picture of a cat. Is it going to tell me that it's a cat? Is it going to understand that it's a cat? Now, once I've created the model, I have the opportunity to deploy the model. And deploying the model is really where I use the model with new data. Let me give you a simple example that, that probably most of you have used um, a number of times in a smartphone camera app, be it Android or, or iOS, if I were to pull my smartphone out and open the camera app, what it would do is it would put a box around all the faces that it finds. So it's using a form of artificial intelligence called face identification, not face recognition, I'm not trying to recognize whose face it is, it's just trying to recognize that it's a face. So, it, and it, it's based off of tons of pictures that, that Apple or Android or whoever has had in the past. So they've deployed it. They've deployed it in my smartphone. And when they deployed it in my smartphone, it's actually using it on a new picture that's never been analyzed before, whatever my camera is pointed at today. So that would be a new, new data. And then I would do some prediction. Now the prediction in the simple example is the box around the face. But what we want to do is we want to turn that into an action. We want to turn that into some um, actionable step that does something. In the case of my smartphone example, it uses the information of where the faces are and the automated action is an autofocus. So the output of this prediction is now an autofocus. If I'm looking at an example that's more relevant for uh, the telecom industry, maybe I'm going to take a large amount of customer data, create a model that detects or, or tries to predict if someone's going to leave one operator to go to another operator, use that on new data, and then based off of that prediction, I think the subscriber might churn, send them to a human being, which is in the customer retention department, or maybe automate sending an email or a text message to that subscriber saying, hey, here's a discount, a discount coupon or what have you. So this is the high level AI life cycle. What we're going to focus on today is we're going to focus on really not so much the training part, we're going to focus on the use cases. 
what are some examples where we could use artificial intelligence and machine learning? Now, I think it's worth mentioning, and I have it at the, the very bottom of the graphic, is over time, what I may do is I may look at the results. I may look and say, you know what? I predicted that this particular customer would churn and he didn't. I didn't predict that, um, that that one would churn, but they did. So what I might do is I might take more data, retrain my model, and then redeploy it. Now we've seen this, we've seen this type of thing in action. When I've updated my operating system on my smartphone, my camera app might have gotten better. Well, what's happened is they retrained the model, they've got a better model, and it was updated as part of me deploying that new operating system. So AI and automation lifecycle. Now with that as a backdrop, what I would like to do is I'd like to look at a number of use cases. And in all of these use cases, we're trying to solve one of these narrow AI problems. Now, as we think about this from a, com a, a communication service provider, a telecom operator's perspective, there's a number of ways that we could think through this. What this chart is showing, and this comes from a Gartner report, we have on the x-axis, the number of opportunities. How many opportunities are there in the communication service provider space for this type of artificial intelligence use case? And then on the y-axis, how feasible is it within the telecom industry? So let me give you an example. This upper right-hand quadrant is really the most interesting one. Speech analytics. Well, we'll take a look at that. That's going to be something with respect to chatbots. Deep learning. Most of the problems we're going to talk about are more complicated. So therefore, they'll require more of a deep learning than machine learning. But really, it's the same thing. It's just more complicated. It's kind of like saying, um, what's the difference really between algebra and calculus? Well, calculus is really just more complicated algebra. And so you can think of algebra like machine learning, calculus like deep learning. Intelligence on the edge. How can I deploy something potentially in an edge network and then a lot more personalization type things? So we'll focus on kind of that piece. So let me talk about two that are a little bit more universal. They're not really telecom centric, but they are applicable within telecom. And the first one is natural language processing associated with chatbots. There's, there's another form of bot that's referred to as a robot, robotic process art automation, RPA. That's really about trying to do some type of software bot to, um, track what a, a user's doing on the screen or to copy paste between systems. Uh, it's really used in, to automate processes where automation isn't built into the actual application. At Award Solutions, we have a, a system that we've been using for 15 years um, that is our training management system. And it's a good example. It's one of the ones I like to use is because when it was built, it wasn't built with things like application programming interfaces in mind. And so as things have evolved, it hasn't. And it's just not worth it to us to fix it. it, it it's not that important. What, I, what I've done is I've created some bots to do some basic automation on a system that really wasn't designed for automation. And that's really all we'll say about RPA. A chatbot is a, um, a bot that's going to take some type of text and convert that into the intended request of the subscriber. And, I, and I'm, I'm using this term intended request very deliberately. Human speech is really hard. And natural language processing is really, really hard. And so if I were to put something in a chat, I can't just parse each of the individual words. 
because sometimes that doesn't really give me the meaning. I need to look at things in context. And a chatbot is doing that. So it's trying to take what I write and convert it to actually the intended thing and then take actions based off of that. So let me show you a simple example of this. I always like this example. And so let's say I've created a chatbot for award solutions and I'll call it the award technical assistant bot. And I go and I type in my chatbot, what time does the AI and machine learning class start? Now as human beings, that's not a big deal for us, right? We, we would understand that very easily. But what does the computer do? Well, it's starting to go through this and it's having to look for things. So what is a question? Time, time could mean a lot of different things. When we use the term time in this context, what we're typically meaning is a specific hour. And on top of that, it means a specific time zone. So for me, I'm in central time zone in the United States. And so it means this particular webinar started at 11 a.m. If you're in some other time zone, it still started at 11 a.m. my time, but your time, it would have been different. AI and machine learning class. Okay, that's a specific name. That's a label. That's a product. That's a SKU that I'm looking for. And then start has a very specific meaning as well. So you can see this phrase though it's pretty easy for us humans to figure out, for the computer it's needing to figure out how to give a response. And it just so happens the response starts at 3 p.m. So it's parsing that and giving the response. There's a lot of aspects of, of natural language processing. It's really kind of a cool field and uh, we don't have time to go into it as much as I would like. But uh, there are some people doing some really cool creative things with natural language processing. One of my favorite things, if uh, as an aside, I'll put this into the, the chat. Um, it's a, a company called Botnik. Uh, they basically do uh, AI generated fan fiction. And so they're in the process of sending out um, on, their, on their monthly newsletter, um, AI generated Harry Potter fan fiction. I find this stuff kind of funny. Natural language processing. Another example that we would have potentially within the telecom industry would be image recognition. And this particular example, what you see is I just have a, um, a traffic cam and a number of, of cars driving down the street. And what we've done is we've said, I want you to identify all of the cars. Now, why would I do that? Why would I want to identify all the cars? Well, maybe I want to identify the cars because I want to do an analysis of traffic. And so I'm wanting to just count the number of cars on the road. Maybe it's more of a security purpose. And what I may do, even though they're blurred out in my graphic, I may take all of the license plates, take the information that's on the license plate, convert the license plate number to real letters and numbers. And then I might even just log all the license plates or go to some type of government body and do a, a lookup. So I know who's on this particular road at this given point in time. So these are some examples of using image recognition. Within the telecom space, image recognition has been used for taking drone footage of cell sites and seeing if there's problems. I've even heard of, of use cases where people are taking infrared pictures of cell site equipment or network equipment. And based off of the infrared, deciding if something is a problem or not. So image recognition. So let's kind of take this one step further and let's look at an example that, that is a good lead in for what we want to talk about here in a little bit. I'm going to take some network data, whatever that network data is, and I'm going to train a model to identify something. I'm going to identify a failure. I'm going to identify, um, a problem, I'm gonna identify a attack on my firewall, whatever that is. Then I'm gonna deploy it in my network. 
I'm going to take new data, take some prediction, and then take some action. Hopefully automated, but maybe I'm going to send it to a human being and let the human being take action. And again, that's not bad. I mean, think about a 5G network. If you've got a 5G network, you may have thousands and thousands of cell sites. If what I could do is predict what 10% of my cell site or 5% of my cell sites or 1% of my cell sites have a problem and send human beings to those cell sites to proactively, preemptively fix things, that's huge. I mean, I mean that's, that's just a monster benefit. So let me pause for a second. Any questions, comments, or thoughts um, of what we've discussed so far? All right, excellent. So we talked about some basic use cases, specifically um, image recognition and natural language processing, and those are both great examples. Let's look at some more examples that are more telecom focused. And at any, po at any point, if you've got some other use cases that you're looking at potentially, please, you know, I'd love to hear what those are. Put those into the chat. This is a chart, it's a little bit on the older side from Gartner. And I've been looking, I've wanted to replace this slide with a more updated. But what this is focusing on is communication service providers, use cases in AI. And the way that you read this chart is the farther along the X axis we are, the more of a requirement of something like machine learning. The higher on the y-axis we are, the more use cases there are. So let's start with kind of a bad example. My bad example is billing. We've been doing billing for 100 years. I mean, we've been doing billing based off of a telecommunications network for a really, really long time. Not really something that needs a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning. But we start looking at cases like network planning and engineering, fraud management, security. These are cases where we're just, we're able to do some things without machine learning, but machine learning would help it be better. So we're gonna look at a number of examples over the, the next few uh, slides. One of the first ones we'll look at is one that isn't obvious. It's actually kind of a, a uh, an interesting example with field services. With field services, what we're really trying to say is, how can I optimize my people? How can I have a, a machine learning algorithm do a better job of managing where I send my human beings to fix problems? Another way we might phrase this is workforce optimization. Because really one of my challenges is not sending people to, to sites to fix problems. It's to maximize the benefit of sending people to sites to fix problems. Because we're always going to need to have people going to sites to solve some problems. I can't remotely fix everything. So one study that I saw, which I found was quite interesting, was that 10% this particular um, study was saying they wanted to have 10% of all emergency field service work to be triaged and scheduled by AI. Now imagine if you lived in a part of the world that was impacted by things like hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, something that, that had an impact where it typically caused a very large number of cell sites to be out. Wouldn't it be nice to have an, an algorithm be able to analyze all the data and send people to the right place to maximize how quickly we can be up and running again. I've worked with operators here in the United States and I've worked with operators uh, where I've had a class I was teaching 
um, in person. I'd flown to another state, was teaching a class, and everybody in the class had to leave because a hurricane was coming to some other part of the country in two or three days. So they were leaving now to drive to that other part of the country to stay in a hotel until the hurricane hit so they could be there to fix problems. Be nice if we could maximize that. Field services. Finance. Finance is, a, is an interesting area. Um, how can we maximize our, our finances with some type of an AI algorithm? I, I saw an article just a few days ago about um, someone trying to teach an AI algorithm how to pick stocks and buy stocks the same way that Warren Buffett would, would buy stocks. That's like, man, that sounds really cool. This is a very difficult problem to solve. Is there any other thing that we might be able to take advantage of? If we had an, uh, an AI algorithm that was like the ultimate accountant and it could take all of this data and try all of these possibilities and come up with the best possible tax portfolio return, whatever that is. Network assurance. Simply what network assurance is, is nothing more than how do we verify, how do we validate, how do we maintain our network and make sure customers can, can do things that they need to do? How do we make sure our network is rock solid? How do we make sure our network is working properly? So it would be really nice to take large amounts of data, process that data, and see where there are potential problems. Now, now you might be thinking, we've been doing network assurance for ever. This is not a new concept at all. But if you think about it, how have we been doing network assurance for the past hundred years? We may not have used this term that entire time, but it's really more KPI based, key performance indicator. And what KPIs are is this is really some basic math based off of a small number of counters call attempts call failures call drops handover attempts handover failures those sorts of things but it's a small number of counters that we've done some math and made into a key performance indicator but what if i were to say to you no 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 i don't want to do it that way anymore i don't want to do it based off of a key performance indicator what i want to do is i want want to take a very large amount of data. I want to take all counters plus all logs plus all customer support tickets plus all social media and I want to take all of this stuff together and build an algorithm to see what's going on. It's quite an interesting thing to think about. Going from using just a fraction of the data that's available to us to actually everything that's possibly available to us. Network assurance. Security and, and fraud management. Fraud is a very interesting area. And there's a specific form of machine learning that is very valuable in the security and the fraud space. And that is referred to as anomaly detection. Now, what anomaly detection is, is let's just say for the sake of argument, I have some data and I'm just gonna draw it on a two dimensional plane. And so this is all of my data data points, whatever this data point represents. What anomaly detection is going to do is it's going to take the data and it's going to see what's statistically normal. And whatever statistically normal is, is what we want to learn and then specifically what we want to then do is to go in and say what's 
abnormal. What's statistically outside of the normal? Now, they may or may not be problems. It's just outside of normal. As a matter of fact, the way I've drawn this data, this may be exceptionally good. And this may be exceptionally bad. But if I can start with the points that I've circled and ignore the stuff that's quote unquote normal, then this gives me a huge benefit in my analysis. This is anomaly detection. This is also a very, very hard problem to solve. I host the AI intelligence meetup. Uh, we meet once a month, and one of the other people that's in the AI Intellicom meetup, he has presented on anomaly detection. And uh, it's a very difficult topic but it's a very, very fruitful topic. And that's a good example of what security and fraud management is trying to do is it's trying to understand what normal is, normal from data's flowing through a firewall, normal from credit card transactions, and then trying to predict what abnormal is so that we can take action. Now that action may be assign this to a human. The action may be automate something. And so if we find something that doesn't seem right from our firewall, maybe we're just going to shut off the uh, that stream of information in our firewall. Network planning and engineering is similar to what we were talking about before with our network assurance. Right now we use a fraction of the data that's available to us for our network planning and engineering. What happens if we could use more of it? And we start to look at things like traffic patterns, right? Is there something I can do dynamically um, where I have more people during the day than uh, that's in a location than at night? Um, how do I do traffic? How do I do network planning and engineering when we're dealing with something like a, a, a pandemic when the nature of the way we behave has changed? How do we learn how to behave in that new normal? So I did network planning and engineering for uh, a number of years prior to coming to Award Solutions. And so this is always an area that I think about. And how do I um, forecast my data? As a matter of fact, there's an area within artificial intelligence called a recurrent neural network or an RNN. And what the RNNs do is they focus on time series. So maybe all I want to do is to use AI to do a time series project, project, projection so that I can better predict the future. Okay, so let's take everything that we've talked about and kind of pull it together. What I want to do is I want to deploy a network that uses artificial intelligence to make decisions automatically. And there's three good places we can think about in that. So I've deployed a virtualized network. I'm supporting functions like NFV, SDN. I've got virtual machines or containers that are running on servers. So there's three great places that I can put artificial intelligence machine learning. One, I'll have something called a service orchestrator. And what the service orchestrator is going to do is it's going to manage, it's going to look at are my services where they need to be? Do I have enough um, functionality? Do I have enough uh, capacity for my services? Another place is in my resource orchestration. Do I detect that there may be a problem? Do I detect that I need to scale? Do I need to detect that I've got too much capacity and I could remove some capacity? Is my latency too high for whatever reason? And then a third place is in the area of uh, network orchestration. Is my transport network working properly? Am I having any transport network issues? We had a funny problem that just occurred. I, I just, just found out about this today, that 
um, a number of people that work at Award Solutions are having a similar problem with respect to VPN and whoever their internet service provider is. And so VPN and my internet service provider aren't working well with each other and I had to do a fix to fix that. That would have been a nice thing to, to have an algorithm detect that that wasn't working. Now, what I find interesting, and, and I just learned this a few days ago, there are some AI tools that are being built specifically with this type of stuff in mind. So, for example, there is a Linux Foundation project called Oculus. It was originally an AT&T thing pushed into open source. Their latest version of Oculus, which was just released, I want to say back in April, it already has the ability to support AI algorithms within a resource orchestrator that the Linux Foundation supports called ONAP, the Open Network Automation Platform. So that's a good example of a project that's trying to kind of close that loop. It's trying to say, I want to have um, a AI algorithm that I can then deploy inside of an orchestrator of some form. So it's kind of a cool concept. Can't tell you much more than that, than, than it's, that it has uh, that vision and this interaction is supported, but it's a cool concept. It's a cool concept. Okay, so we talked a little bit about AI um, use cases within the telecom industry. Any questions, comments, thoughts at this point? All right, excellent. So what I want to do now is I want to, to shift gears and I want to talk about what I refer to as telecom impacting AI use cases. And what I mean by that is that this isn't a use case that a service provider will implement. Um, this isn't like um, optimizing my 5G core or um, network assurance or even things like security and fraud management. What this is, is this is more of a service outside of the telecom operator that will have a big impact on the telecom operator. And there's three big examples of this that I thought of, and there's probably more. But we'll start with one of my favorite, which is autonomous driving. I don't know what your view of autonomous driving is. Uh, I think it's just kind of cool. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, NVIDIA's GPU technology conference back in, in 2019 and had an opportunity to talk to a number of autonomous vehicle companies that were there in the exhibit floor. And it is a very interesting use case. And just to be clear, the way everybody is looking at autonomous driving today is I'm building a server inside of the car itself. And if you believe what NVIDIA is saying, it's got to have GPUs. NVIDIA GPUs is part of it. But I've got a server that's built in the car itself. And the car is going to have a number of sensors. Typically, those sensors are going to include cameras. And I'm very clear that the S at the end is important, cameras. It's going to have radar, it's going to have LIDAR, and all of that data is going to be fed to this server, which will then make a millisecond by millisecond decision of what needs to be done. Do I need to apply the brakes or do I need to apply the accelerator? Do I need to turn left or do I need to turn right? So what does this have to do with telecom? Well, on the surface, nothing. I might not have any relationship with telecom. And as a matter of fact, the way things are working today in all of the existing autonomous driving, it has really no impact on the telecom network at all. It's completely separate. In uh, one of the suburbs of Dallas, not too far from where I live, there's actually a autonomous driving taxi type service that you can use. I've not used it. It's not something that's really convenient for me but it is um, something that's there. 
uh, Arizona um, and California have seen a large amount of autonomous driving trials today. So how does this have an impact on the telecom industry? Well, the impact on the telecom industry is really with respect to data sharing. So right now, the way I've drawn this picture, this car is taking all of this information that it's receiving and making a local decision, which is great. But what's happening one mile ahead? What's happening around the corner? Is there a way that I can include information from the cell site, from the network that tells what's going on, the current traffic conditions. Wouldn't it be great if I knew, if my car knew that one, 10, 20 miles ahead, there was an accident. One, 10, 20 miles ahead, there was a, um, an ice slick because it's winter and we're starting to see people um, start to skid out on ice. We see a really bad storm. We see something that's flooding. And so if I know a car a mile ahead of me or five miles ahead of me is stopped, my car may slow down early so that by the time it gets there, I'm not part of the wreck. This is referred to as V to X. And there's a a number of different flavors of V to X, and one of them is vehicle to network. How can my network share information with the cars so that we can have more information that's up and coming? So this is an area that a lot of operators are looking at trying to do some support of. There is, 5G does have a set of protocols that are designed specifically for this, sharing this information. Another flavor, which is outside of the telecom industry, is called V to V. Have the vehicles talk to each other directly? And this is something some manufacturers are starting to look at. I think V to X is gonna be the better solution because it's gonna be able to provide more information. I'll be able to get more information of, of a wider area versus just the cars that are nearby. I really like the autonomous driving uh, concept. And I think the impact on the, the telecom network could be quite interesting. So autonomous driving is a good example. Another good example is Internet of Things. And with Internet of Things, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep valuable information, but not everything. So let's think about this for a second. So Internet of Things, all this is really talking about is how I have a number of devices. And Internet of Things is a very generic term. Um, if you have a um, Alexa in your house, if you have a Nest thermometer, thermostat in your house, uh, if you have a, you know, a webcam in your house, those are all examples of Internet of Things. And so it really has a very wide variety of things. My wife is, is very much into growing flowers. And so she has a couple of sensors in the house. It's really nothing more than moisture sensor. What's the, the, the um, um, how much moisture is in the air? Uh, what's the humidity? And if the humidity is too low, then she waters her plants more. Okay? It's not an automated process, but it's information. What if I were to have a factory or a large farm, and I had a large number of sensors, and those sensors were providing information on a very, very regular period of time. For example, I may have something that tells me humidity on a per second basis, and it's looking at humidity, temperature, moisture in the ground, uh, anything like that, and it's telling me this on a second-by-second -second basis. Do I need all of that information to be stored? No. But what I might need to do is I might need to detect if there's a problem and, and do an action. So I might build a model that receives all of this data, analyzes the data, and then it does two things. One, summarizes. For May 15th, 
from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., the average barometric pressure was whatever. The average temperature was whatever. I want to know that from a statistic so I can do some, some post-processing, but I don't need the second by second results. But two, it can then take action. And that action may be have a human being involved, or it may be something simple like, hey, um, this part of the, the vineyard, our ground moisture is a little bit too low, so we're gonna send a drone, and the drone is going to then apply water in that area, or we'll turn on some, some sprinkler system. Or we have, we're detecting too much activity of a certain type of bug, so we're going to send some type of a drone that's gonna go and apply some type of a pesticide, or whatever the case may be. But what I want you to see in this is I want you to see how what we're doing with AI is we're taking this large volume of data, one, processing it to get some type of insight, and then two, storing information, and again, providing actions. And this is similar when we start to look at things like augmented re reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And all of that together is just abbreviated as XR, extended reality. On the left, we have virtual reality. On the right, we have augmented reality, mixed reality. Virtual reality is where I put on a headset and I am completely immersed in this fake, this virtual world. So why is this anything to do with AI? Well, AI is used in some of the predictive algorithms of how the world needs to behave. So people are using machine learning techniques as part of building this game or building this immersive experience. How does this have an impact on telecom? Well, these headsets are really challenging to build getting the optics right, getting the amount of information, getting the processing power. So what some people are trying to do is they're trying to deploy some hardware close to the cell site that's doing the, the real processing of the data and then sending this information to the device so that it has a smaller footprint, it has less processing power, a lower battery. So why is this a big deal? Well, one of the things that's important about virtual reality is we have a delay of 20 milliseconds. This is referred to as a photon to motion delay. And that photon to motion delay has to be less than 20 milliseconds. And here, here's why, imagine I put on my virtual reality headset. And so what's on the screen is whatever is presented to me. Now, when I move my head, I feel my head moving. I know I'm moving my head. My brain knows I'm moving my head. But if the image doesn't change as I move my head, over time, a, a part of my brain starts to kind of freak out. It doesn't understand what's going on. And that's where you start to get nauseous. That's where you get this VR sickness. So in other words, I need my telecom network to be able to support a very high uh, data bandwidth, a very low delay, a low latency so that I can have the service that literally doesn't make a subscriber sick. Augmented reality, mixed reality is, is similar in the sense that I'm trying to take an image and in this particular thing, I'm taking a picture from my camera and I'm overlaying information on that image. Uh, I always go back as an example. I was talking to a, a coworker of mine. We were going through uh, this type of example and he and I were in Manhattan together and we were trying to find a specific restaurant. And this is well before a lot of these type of technologies were available. And so I said, wouldn't it have been great if I could have just taken my smartphone, held it up and pointed it a direction and at least tell me if I'm going in the right direction or not. That's what this is talking about. But in that same vein, if I have my camera pointed at a building and it says that it has a specific store in that building, but there's a delay, then I might have the arrow pointed at the wrong place. I might walk into the wrong building. 
So as a matter of fact, for augmented reality and mixed reality, it's a 10 millisecond delay. If we get more than 10 milliseconds, it starts to cause problems. So how about you? Are there any use cases that you can think of that you would like to talk about? Are there any questions that you may have about artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning or anything like that? Well, guys, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. I hope that this has been a valuable use of your time. Again, if you'd like to, to reach out to me, uh, easiest ways you can send me a, an email or you can reach out to me in um, on LinkedIn. Um, question popped up on the chat. Can AI be used for legal? It's a, it's a very good question. And yes, one of the things I've seen within the legal space is they're using that natural language processing. There's an aspect of natural language processing called text summarization. And so what I've seen people do is I've seen people use the, the text summarization to take large legal documents and kind of break it down into those key pieces that we need to make sure that we're, we're adhering to, like in a contract type of thing. Um, so yes, AI for sure can, can be used in legal and there's a lot of legal implement, implications to AI. Kind of as a side note, on Monday, May 18th, there is a um, going to be a discussion about AI and kind of uh, ownership of AI and some legal issues with AI um, as part of the AI and telecom meetup. You can find me on the meetup page or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn if you'd like to know more. It's open and it'll be online. All right, fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, the time that they've uh, put into this today. I really do appreciate uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you do have any questions. And we will be coming back in June with another webinar. And so I hope to see you then. Thank you guys so much and take care.